Thank you, Pete, for that introduction, and thank you, Young Society, and especially the board members, for the invitation to present tonight. I also want to thank my collaborator, colleague, and friend, Henry Scott, for sharing his talent with us tonight on this program. Henry and I met 15 years ago, and our early conversations centered around our common interests in Joseph Campbell. So it is especially fitting that we are now presenting a program together informed by Campbell's work. I believe that Campbell and our early conversations led to my own enduring fascination with myth. Perhaps my deepest thanks then goes to Joseph Campbell himself, whom I never met, but whose work has so profoundly informed my own. I am a member of the generation that first came upon Campbell's work through the series The Power of Myth, first broadcast in 1988. Since then, I have been reading, listening to, studying, writing about, and creating performances inspired by his work. Pete mentioned the production The Hero's Journey at the Mythic Journeys Conference in 2004, and I, I thank you for those of you who've attended that program, and I know that we have at least two of the cast members here, and I thank them for coming tonight. I remember also that Dennis Slattery at Pacifica Graduate Institute invited his students in a graduate seminar on Campbell to create your own Joseph Campbell. And so tonight, I think I'm honoring Dr. Slattery in presenting, in a sense, my own Joseph Campbell. I do not claim to be an expert on Campbell. I have not read all of his books yet. But I am someone who is deeply touched by his work which models for us an inherently poetic response to the world's great mythologies and challenges the individual to take responsibility for his or her own spiritual journey. Tonight, I invite you to listen to these stories and my comments on Campbell and consider your own Joseph Campbell. I also understand that stories take us places and that their rich images will fire your imaginations the real stories do not take place up here with me, but in each of your imaginations. Therefore, if you listen better with your eyes closed, letting those images rise on their own, I invite you to do so. The program lasts about 70 minutes. Afterwards, we will take a break and then reconvene. I invite you then to share your own responses to these stories. What ideas most impress you? What most inspires? What images stick? What resonances do you find between the stories and Campbell's work, or between one story and another? And as a hook to stay, after our discussion, we will end with one final story, if you wish. Many consider Campbell's best book to be The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Here, as many of you know, he describes the circular hero's journey pattern, or what he calls the monomyth, a borrowing a term from James Joyce, one of his favorite authors. The standard path of the mythological adventure of the hero is a magnification of the formula represented in the rites of passage identified first by Arnold van Gennep. Separation, initiation, return which Campbell calls the nuclear unit of the monomyth. A hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from the mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. Campbell takes that threefold pattern, separation, initiation, return, and identifies key moments or phases within that pattern. Campbell helps us read the tales by recognizing that they may isolate and greatly enlarge on one or two of the typical elements of the full hero cycle. In other words, as I have found, stories tend to focus on certain aspects of the monomyth, while others may only be implied. Tonight, I will offer some commentary a few pertinent quotations, but the real focus is on the stories themselves, 
stories of different kinds of heroes, some from myths, some from folk tales, some from literature, many of which are mentioned by Campbell in The Hero with a Thousand Faces. journey is the call to adventure, which may take the form of a blunder. As Campbell says, a blunder, apparently the merest chance, reveals an unsuspected world. That blunder may amount to the opening of a destiny. The call rings up the curtain always on the mystery of transfiguration, a rite, a moment, a spiritual passage, which when complete, amounts to a dying and a birth. This first story features a call in the form of a blunder and also a magic flight once the hero possesses the elixir. As Campbell says, if the trophy has been attained against the opposition of its guardian, <laughs> then the final stage of the mythological round becomes a lively pursuit. From Wales, the tale of Guiam Bach. Caridwin, the great goddess, walked along the shores of Lake Tegig with a heavy heart. She was thinking of her children. Her daughter, Kariri, fair and beautiful, and her son, Ahadu. Ugly and misshapen. And the great goddess thought deeply. She wanted more than anything to give Abadu gifts to compensate. But even the great goddess could not change his appearance. And so she was sad and wandered as she wandered around that lake. And then she decided that the gift she most wanted to give him were the gifts of poetry and prophecy. And so, she went to her book of shadows and read the deep magic until she found the spell. It would require her to gather special herbs throughout the world, special herbs picked at the right season of the year, at the right phase of the moon, at the right time of the day, and then boil them in her great cauldron of inspiration for a year and a day. And after the herbs had boiled down, there would be three magic drops left that would rise, and the rest of the cauldron would be filled with toxic poison. Now, Caridwin 
had to spend that year in the day continuing to gather herbs. And so she sent two of her slaves to tend the cauldron. An old blind man, blind in one eye because Keridwin had knocked it out in a fit of rage. And his job was to find the firewood and stoke the cauldron. And a young man, a simpleton, named Guion Bach to stir the cauldron. And they did so all those many months while Keridwin gathered the herbs, traveling and choosing the herbs at the right point in the seasons, at the right phase of the moon, and at the right time of the day. And then the men shared the work. And when one grew tired and needed rest, the other would have to tend both the fire and stir the cauldron. One day, towards the end of that year and a day, it was Morda's turn to tend the cauldron alone while Guion slept on a cot, and the old man was tired and sore from the work and tired of stirring and stoking the fire. And finally he went to the cot and kicked it. Get up and you tend the cauldron. But it's my turn to sleep. But too late. The old man was in the cot and <sighs> snoring. And so Guion the sleep still in his eyes, complaining, I'm tired of this. I don't want to stir the cauldron anymore. But he picked up the big stick and stirred. But he was so tired that he nodded off. And in that moment, three magic drops rose from the cauldron and burnt his hand. seemed to spin. Everything changed. And Guion could see into the future. And he could see Keridwin's rage. And so he fled. And just at the moment, the cauldron, filled with the poison, cracked into him. Keridwin returned and saw the cauldron and immediately knew the spell had worked. But who took the magic? And then she saw the old man sleeping on the cot. She grabbed a piece of wood, about to beat out his other eye, and he said, No! No! No, it wasn't me! Guidon was tending the cauldron! Guidon! Heroin pursued. Guidon was running as fast as he could go, and he looked back, and he saw the great goddess skating on him. And so, he transformed himself into a hare. But Herod, being a great goddess, transformed herself into a greyhound and pursued. Guion, looking back, ran as fast as he could go, and he reached a river. And so he jumped, transforming into a fish and into the water, and fled. But Herod, being a great goddess, transformed herself into an otter, jumped into the river, and pursued. Guion broke through the water, bursting into the air as a bird, and fled. But Herod, being a great goddess, transformed herself into a hawk, and pursued. They flew over grasslands, over hollow lands, over hilly lands, over farmlands, until Guion saw a great heap of wheat, winnowed wheat, below him. And so he transformed himself into a single grain and fell into the wheat. But Herod, being a great goddess, knew exactly which grain was Guion, transformed herself into a black crested hen and ate the wheat. <laughs> Nine months have passed, and Herod was now great with child. She hated that baby, for she knew it was Guion transformed in the cauldron of her womb. And she vowed upon his birth to dash out its head against the rocks. And so, on the 
birth day of April, she placed the baby into an old leathern bag and brought it to the river and cast it upon the waters. Now, in another part of the kingdom was a prince named Elfin. Oh, he was the most unlucky prince that ever was. And his father, the king, felt sorry for him. And so he promised him the greatest catch of salmon in the year, which happens on May Eve. There was a great weir set in a river to catch the salmon. And on May Eve, Elfin and his men traveled to the weir to collect the salmon. But upon arrival, Elfin saw that the weir was empty. There was no salmon at all, only an old leathern bag. I am the unluckiest man alive, he cried. And he grabbed that old bag and was about to fling it further out into the water when it wriggled. And so he opened it. And there was the beautiful baby. He held the baby up to his men. They fell on their knees. And one of them quietly said, And Alvin said, yes, radiant, and I shall name him Taliesin, which means radiant brow. And Taliesin grew to be the greatest bard in all of Britain. The tale of Guion Bach. The refusal of the call. We may, if given the choice, refuse the call. For calls to adventure can be very inconvenient. As Bilbo says to Gandalf in The Hobbit, Hobbits are plain, quiet folk and have no use for adventures. Nasty, uncomfortable things make you late for dinner. We don't want any adventures here. Thank you. But, as Campbell says, the refusal of the call is essentially the refusal <coughs> to give up on what one takes to be one's own life interest. The future is regarded not in terms of an unremitting series of deaths and births, but as though one's present system of ideals, virtues, goals, and advantages were to be fixed and made secure. David Maloof in his fine book, An Imaginary Life, says something similar. What else should our lives be but a continual series of beginnings, of painful settings out into the unknown, pushing off from the edges of consciousness into the mystery of what we have not yet become? What else is death but the refusal any longer to grow and suffer change? Perhaps the best-known example of the refusal of the call is Lot's wife in the Bible, who turns into a pillar of salt. In some stories, the refusal of the call is also the refusal of the adventure of love. In the Greek myth of Apollo and Daphne, Daphne turns into a laurel tree to avoid the love of Apollo. And sometimes the refusal of the call to the adventure of love is tied to the refusal to face our own shadow. In the celebrated short story and film Brokeback Mountain, the character Ennis suffers a dried up existence by refusing to live openly with the love of his life, Jack. We find that refusal also in this folktale collected by Diane Volkstein from Haiti. The story of Owl. Owl was so ashamed of his looks that he would never go out during the day, but only at night in the deep shadows. One night, he met a young girl, and they met each and every night, and soon Owl and the girl were in love. Oh, 
oh, they would meet, and they would talk and talk and talk. The next day she told her mother, marry him. Said the mother, why, I've never even seen his face. He never comes during the daytime, only at night when it's dark. But the girl wouldn't listen to her mother. And so the mother said, I know. I'll have a party for you to celebrate your engagement on Sunday in the afternoon. And she thought to herself, then I'll get to see his face. The girl was very excited and told Owl all oh, that night. He was so excited. But then he realized the party was in the afternoon. And he would have to go during the day. And the girl would see his face. And she would no longer love him. And so, he asked his best friend, Rooster, to go with him, moral support. <laughs> and so, when Sunday came along, the two friends got into a cart. An owl took the reins to the horses and sat by it side by side, and they talked back and forth, as friends do. And then, Owl began to notice Rooster's fine feathers. And then he began to notice Rooster's strong profile. And Owl felt uglier than ever. He pulled the reins on the horses and he said, I can't go. Tell them anything. Tell them a branch hit me in the eyes and, and the sunlight hurts. I'll be there after dark at night and ran off. Well, Rooster didn't know what else to do. So he picked up the reins and rode the horses to the girl's house. And there he knocked on the door. The girl opened the door. But there was no owl, just Rooster. Oh, a small accident. No need to be worried. A, a branch hit Owl in the eyes, and the sunlight hurts them. And so he'll be here after dark. <laughs> the girl was just happy that Owl was not hurt. Oh, it was a wonderful party. The entire yard was filled with guests, neighbors, and friends. And after sunset, as the shadows of night grew on, there was a second knock at the door. The girl ran to answer it, and there was Owl. But he had a great big hat on and pulled the brim down over his face, just in case. The girl was delighted to see him. She took him to the party and introduced him to all of her friends and all of her guests. Oh, they had a wonderful time that night. And they danced and they danced and they danced. The moon away. And then, just as rosy fingered dawn, was breaking over the mountaintops, the girl's mother came up behind Owl and said, Now I'll get to see your face and pull the hat off him! Ah! Screamed Owl and covered his face with his wings and ran out of the party, out of the yard, into the road. Owl! The girl running after him. Owl! Owl! And just then Owl turned in the road and the girl saw journey, the descent into the underworld. 
The questing heroic character embodies the masculine assertive principle and therefore is often represented by a male character. However, there are stories that represent the questing hero with a female character, most notably the Sumerian myth of Inanna, who travels to the underworld to meet her sister and in effect her own shadow. And the story of Psyche, who quests for her lost lover Cupid, in which Campbell says, all the principal roles are reversed. The well-known Greek myth of Demeter, Persephone, and Hades begins with a call that is an immediate descent into the underworld. Hades' abduction of Persephone results in the creation of the seasons. Persephone lives with her mother Demeter on the earth during the summer and her husband Hades in the underworld during the winter. Rita Dove's poem, Demeter Waiting gives voice to Demeter's rage over the abduction of her daughter. The opening line of the poem is, No! Who can bear it? But what of Hades suffering? I wondered. I wrote a poem in response, which gives voice to Hades' loneliness during his long summer that he must endure, waiting for his queen to return. I call it Hades. Wait. Yes. At last. My wife returns. Golden. With her days upon the earth. Filled with the grain of her mother's love. I've waited out the long summer. Lonely turning in my bed, holding only her cold pillow against the night. Her scent, grown faint with my tears. Persephone, I long to hold you again in my arms, kiss your breasts, and run my dark tongue along your white. Who cares if winter comes upon the earth with your mother's grief? We will be heat enough. The Road of Trials. Adventures upset our lives, and I agree with Bilbo. They can be very uncomfortable. Adventures can make you late for dinner. For once accepted, that call leads to what Campbell names the Road of Trials. Once having traversed the threshold, the hero moves in a dream landscape of curiously fluid, ambiguous forms where he must survive a succession of trials. In Henry's original mock epic, a little reindeer hero must face his own Road of Trials, the blue Flannel C. One afternoon, while taking a nap, laying face down on blue flannel sheets, the afternoon sun beamed in through the bedroom window. My eyes opened to see the hair on my right forearm glowing in the light of the sun. And I noticed a piece of lint perched on one of the hairs. I watched as it stood up and fell down. Stood up fell down in the breeze from the air conditioning unit. After a time, it began to resemble a tiny reindeer. Hello, little reindeer, dancing on a hair. How awkward you look, balancing there. Jump off, my friend, jump off, be gone. I said as I stretched and gave a great yawn. The reindeer, he heard, began to prepare for a leap. What a leap to get down from that hair. His legs walk wobbled as he looked down below at the blue flannel sea into which he would go. A moment of panic, his feet lost their grip, but his legs they held on and prevented his trip. Round, round went his body, round, round the strong hair till he righted himself and cried with despair. He 
you look to his left and then to his right. But all that he found, blue flannel inside. He had strayed from the path and wound up on a hair, like so many others on hairs out there. But for him it was different, for it made him recall a time and a place with no fear at all. Before he was restless, before he set out, before he was filled with the world and its doubt. A lifetime ago, maybe two, perhaps three, a lifetime he shared with the blue flannel sea. He threw back his head and remembered the song of life and of death going on for so long. Before reindeer were reindeer, or hares became hares, tumbling over and over without any cares. He sang to the heavens, the mountains, the trees, the oceans, the deserts, his knees and his fleas. He sang from his soul for the first time he sang, and his song through the hills and the valleys it rang. Through churchyards and front yards and side yards and back on a creek and then a river and into the black of a cave where the wind lay resting her head and the song whirled around and around her great bed. She woke with a start, filled with joy and delight, then breathed in a breath and blew with her might, for blowing is just what the wind loves to do when she hears such a song, so honest, so true. Everything danced as the wind had her way. The birds and the leaves had a party that day. The clothes that were hung in the backyard and side were chased about town by people who cried. And the wind kept on blowing. The river stood still. Some even say that it flowed up the hill, up, up the hill to the blue flannel sea where the reindeer stood singing alone as can be. The song gave him courage. He decided to leap to the blue flannel sea so wide and so deep. His feet took their leave. He flew through the air to the wind that was whirling and swirling down there. He sang as he fell, never missing a beat. Saw his face in the water, but before they could beat, the wind bore him up and carried him away. His hooves clipped the surface, producing a spray. I'm flying! I'm flying! Hey, world, look at me! <laughs> I'm alone, but I'm flying as free as can be. The wind heard the reindeer boasting up there. It angered her so that she growled like a bear. What? What does he mean, alone, flying free? I'm the one blowing, so what about me? The wind held her breath, crawled in bed with a grin, pulled the covers up snugly beneath her great chin. Outside it all stopped. The party was done. The birds, the leaves, and the clothes had their fun. But now it was finished, and so was our friend, falling down through the sky to his untimely end. The poor little reindeer, falling so fast, crying his cries, for they might be his last. It was then he remembered, remembered the song of life and of death going on for so long. He lifted his eyes to the heavens he sang, but the sea filled his mouth and drowned his refrain. Down he was sinking, past fishes and eels, past an octopus, playing catch with some seals, into the kelp and the oysters below. Found himself sitting, swaying in the toe. And that's where he stayed for months, perhaps years, till his mind stopped filling his thoughts with its fears. Fears of the indifferent, of not fitting in, of being too smart, too tall, or too thin. Fears that had ruled his life for so long, and the lives of the others who taught him their song. But after a time of sitting alone in a world unfamiliar and far, far from home, he began to 
to wake up, wake up to the truth that the song he remembered was the song of his youth. The song of beginnings, the whole universe sings, the song that gives birth to all living things. Without separation, no aloneness in sight, the great truth of oneness within his birthright. And as he remembered, he looked all around at the wondrous display of life to be found. So many arrangements of shape and degree, all living together as the blue flannel sea. In wonder, in awe, he began to ascend, rising up, rising up from the untimely end, back to the surface, to the life he once knew, to his family, his friends, to me, and to you. To tell of overcoming the fear and despair, and the time he spent stranded, adventure, when all the barriers and ogres have been overcome, is commonly represented by a mystical marriage of the triumphant hero soul with the queen goddess of the world. From Ireland, the story of Nile and sovereignty. There was a king of Ireland who had five sons. One day they went into the forest for a hunt. They caught much game, but as night fell, they realized that they were lost. And so the men built a fire and roasted some game, but they needed water. And so the eldest, Fergus, went deeper into the forest in search of water. And there he found a well, but at the well was a hideous Hag. She had long, stringly hair, and her skin was wrinkled, her teeth were broken and black, and her breath foul. Her eyes dripped pus, her body was shriveled, her hands were gnarled, and her nails were green. You are horrible, said Fergus. Aye, said the hag. Are you guarding the well? Aye. Uh, may I have some water? If uh, you give me a kiss and in seek no, then you get no water from me. So, Fergus returned to his brothers without the water. And brother, after brother, after brother went to the into the forest to the well, but came back with no water. Finally, the youngest, Niall, went to the well, and there he found the hag guarding it. He said, may I have some water? She said, yes, yeah, I <laughs> you give me a kiss, and a cheek. And Niall did so, and embraced her and lay with her. And when he looked, he saw a beautiful maiden with long, lustrous hair, clear skin, bright eyes, white, even teeth, full breasts and lips of party and red. You are fair, woman. I, she answered, who are you? I am sovereignty, she said. And you shall be king at Tara, and you and your seed shall hold dominion over every clan. She bid him return to his brothers with the water, but not give them one drop to drink until they had placed their swords beneath his and swore allegiance to him. And he learned that she was right. Sovereignty 
is often hideous and horrible at first, and won through blood and slaughter. But it is beautiful to hope. And so Nile and his descendants, the O'Neills, held dominion over Ireland. The story of Nile and sovereignty. The myth of sovereignty informs an entire Irish literary tradition that views Ireland as a woman who determines the rightful king. The very name of Ireland comes from Era, one of the three queens of the Tua Dei Danu, Era, Fola, and Badenba. Ireland is personified by an old crone who transforms into a beautiful maiden. She is called by various names, including Kathleen D. Houlihan and the Colyuk Bera, or the Hag of Bera. The poet, W.B. Yeats, was inspired by the mythology of Ireland, and his most famous play, indeed, is Kathleen E. Houlihan. Yeats reworks that tradition in his prose stories of Red Hammerhand, a wandering poet who late in his life is tended on his deathbed by an old hag. At the time of his death, the old hag transforms into a beautiful young woman, a goddess, the image of the divine feminine, she eases Hammerhand's transition out of this world of aging, suffering, and death, welcoming him into her world of eternal beauty. As Hammerhand dies, she sings. Thank you. 
Ireland embodied as a woman, sometimes old and haggard, sometimes young and beautiful, also informs the Ashling, poetic tradition of Ireland, in which the divine feminine is seen in a dream or mystic vision, as in Yeats's poem, The Song of Wandering Angus. I went out to the Hazelwood because a fire was in my head. Cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame. But something rustled on the floor, and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair, who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden Atonement with the Father and Apotheosis. All powerful giants, ogres, and monsters may represent the terrible father figure. They are gigantic, life-threatening, and are, according to Campbell, a reflex of the victim's own ego. <laughs> Only a confrontation with this terrible figure will lead to atonement with the Father at one mint, which in turn leads to a joyous resolution and the hero's apotheosis, as in this folk tale from Spain. The Unbeliever and the Skull. One night, a man who was an unbeliever was walking through a cemetery and he saw a skull. So he kicked it out and he said, come to dinner at my house. <laughs> that evening, as he sat at table, there was a knocking at the door. So he sent his manservant to go answer it. The servant returned. Master, there's a being at the door from the other world. It's a skeleton, nothing but bones. It's a skull. Send him in, <laughs> said the man. The skull entered the dining room and sat opposite the unbeliever and sat there throughout the whole meal. And then, at the end of the meal, the skull rose to its full height and said, I have come to dinner at your house. Now you must come to dinner at my house tomorrow night. You know where it is. You were there this evening. Remember! Vanished. That night, the man lay in bed. Oh, he tossed. Oh, he turned. He broke out in cold sweats. He had a bad night of it. And so, the next morning he went down into the village and sought the advice of a good priest. The priest listened to him though he knew this man was an unbeliever. <laughs> he told his story. I was walking through a cemetery and I uh, saw a skull. So I kicked it. I invited it to dinner. And it came! And now I have to go to dinner in its house and I don't want to go! The priest
priests listened. But even though the man was an unbeliever, he was a good man, and so he said, you must wear this cross and carry these relics. And at nightfall you may stand before the iron gates of the cemetery and you must say, Hail, purest Mary, three times. And then you may go into the cemetery and you may sit with the skull, but do not eat anything. Now go. That night, after nightfall, the unbeliever wearing the cross and carrying the relics stood before the great iron gates of the cemetery and said, Hail, purest Mary. Hail, purest Mary. Hail, purest Mary. The gates of the cemetery slowly opened. And out of the mist, out of one of the graves, was a great long table. And seated at the topmost chair was the skull. Come in, said the skull. The unbeliever went into the cemetery and sat opposite the skull and stayed there throughout the whole meal, but did not eat anything. And at the end of the meal, the skull rose to its full height, clutching something behind its back, and glided down to the far end of the table, and looming over the unbeliever, said, Have you not worn that cross or carried those relics? You would be dead now. And then, Pulling a dagger from behind its back, screamed, Do you believe in God? Do you believe in the Virgin? And the unbeliever said, I believe. I believe. And with that, the table of the sun sank back down. That night, the man sold everything he owned and gave his money to the church and to the poor. He retired to a cave in the mountainside outside of the village, where he lived on nothing but herbs and read scripture. Years passed, and one day that village was filled with a bright, radiant light. And all the people of the village, the young and the old, the rich and the poor, followed that light out of the village, up the mountainside to the cave. And there, inside, upon a flat stone, they found his corpse. And they sang hymns of great joy and praise, for they knew the unbeliever had died a saint. The Unbeliever and the Skull. <laughs> the Refusal of the Return. Once the hero attains the ultimate boon, whether it be a treasure, the elixir of life, the pearl, the adventurer must still return with the life-transmuting trophy. But that responsibility, says Campbell, is frequently refused. The problem of the returning hero is to accept as real, after an experience of the divine or transcendent world, the passing joys and sorrows, the banalities and noisy obscenities of ordinary human life. Why re-enter? such a world. W.B. Yates gives us a hero who does not seek to return to the ordinary world, but to remain forever in transcendent bliss in paradise, his holy city. Sailing to Byzantium. That is no country for old men. The young in one another's arms, the birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song. The salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas. Fish, flesh, fowl, 
commend all some along, whatever is begotten, born, and dies. Caught in that sensual music, all neglect monuments of unaging intellect. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore, I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. O oh, sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, burn in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fastened to a dying animal. It knows not what it is. And gather me into the artifice of eternity. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make, of hammered gold and gold enameling, to keep a drowsy emperor awake, or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium, of what is past, or passing, or to come. The Return and the Ultimate Boom. Jung tells us that a hero is a hero just because he sees resistance to the forbidden goal in all of life's difficulties and yet fights that resistance with the wholehearted yearning that strives toward the treasure hard to attain and perhaps unattainable. <coughs> While Gates' his hero in sailing to Byzantium wishes to stay forever in the sacred world of his holy city, the hero in this Arabic folktale captures the ultimate boon and very much wishes to return. As I mentioned earlier, Campbell acknowledged that individual tales isolate and greatly enlarge upon one or two of the typical elements of the full cycle. However, this final tale is remarkable in its thoroughness of representing the monomyth and its various phases. This tale fulfills what Campbell says, that the return is seeing radiance everywhere. After this last story, we will take a break. And please know that the bookstore will be open during the break, but closed at the end of the program. Then come back for discussion, and if you wish, end with one last story. But now, an Arabic folktale. Yunus, spelled Y-U-N-U-S. Yunus and the well of sweetness. Eunice, a hero, was a man, and he had a fine house and a good fortune. But Eunice was lonely. He was in want of a wife. And he noticed that his neighbor's eldest daughter had grown into a beautiful young woman. And so he went to his neighbor's house and asked for the girl's hand in marriage. Oh, said the neighbor, I would love to have you as a son, but I would never inflict her upon you. <laughs> Why, said you, she's lovely. Oh, she's lovely to look at. She's got a terrible temper. Is there anything that I could do? Well, there is. I'll do it. Oh, but it's very difficult. It requires a long journey. You will have to travel very far. I'll do it, said Eunice. Where must I go? You must travel to the Well of Sweetness and bring back three magic drops 
for that is said to transform anyone's disposition into a sweet one. I'll do it, said Eunice. <laughs> and so the neighbor told him you'll have to go into the village and seek the old beggar woman with the begging bowl in the town square. She will tell you how to get there. So Eunice went to his house, prepared himself for the journey, filled his pockets with gold coins, and down into the village he went. There he found the old beggar woman with her begging bowl. He dropped a gold coin in the bowl, and he said, Please, please, I understand you know the way to the well of sweetness. Ah, the well of sweetness. But she looked at the coin. She looked at Eunice. He seemed nice. And so this magical helper <laughs> took out a small bottle. Take this bottle, and you will fill it at the well. But you must travel far. You must travel seven days to the east, and seven days to the west. And when you reach a broad river, there will be a ferryman to take you across to the land of the giant. And the giant will tell you where the well is. I wish you well. <laughs> he dropped another gold coin into the bowl. Well, Eunice traveled. Off he went. The road of trials. Off he went. Seven days to the east and seven days to the west. And he reached a great broad river. And there, coming out of the mist, was the ferryman. Please, I'd like to go to the land of the giant. <laughs> Nobody goes to the land of the giant and comes back alive. <laughs> oh, but I must go, said Eunice. Well, they say if you're extra polite and give him lots of compliments, maybe then he won't eat you. <laughs> and then he just held out his hand and said, go. And so Eunice gave him a gold coin. <laughs> Eunice gave him another gold coin. <laughs> He gave him a third gold coin. Get in. The ferryman took him across that broad river, crossing the first threshold. And it became night, night, sea, journey. Finally, he reached the far shore. It was the land of the giant. But it was night, and he turned to say goodbye to the ferryman who was already disappearing into the mist, leaving him there alone in the dark. He didn't know what to do, and so he found a soft spot in the grass, and there he fell asleep. But when he awoke, he was not lying on a soft spot in the grass. He was in the giant's hand. Ah! And what do we have here? Said the giant. Oh, most noble giant! More! Oh, most noble, most kind giant! More! Oh, most noble, most kind, most handsome. Giant! Very well. What do you want? And you just explained you wanted to go to the well of sweetness. Ah, the well of sweetness. It's a long way, but if I tell you how to get there, you must promise to return, and then give me a favor too. You disagreed. And so the giant told him he had to climb the tall mountain, and there was a cave, and inside the cave was the well of sweetness. But there was also a three-headed, fire-breathing dragon, and Eunice had to say, Hail, holy Suleiman, let me pass, or else the dragon would burn him to a singe. Off Eunice went, he climbed that mountain all the way up and found the little cave, into the cave he went over rocks and boulders. It was so dark he couldn't see. And then suddenly, three fire-breathing dragons came out. Hail, holy Suleiman, let me pass. But the dragon withdrew. Deeper and deeper, Eunice went into the cave until he came to a golden chamber. And there was a well. And seated at the well was a beautiful genie with long yellow hair. Suddenly, <coughs> Eunice heard genie music. <laughs> yes, said the beautiful genie. 
And Judas said, please, I only wish to have three drops from the well of sweetness. But of course you shall, she said. And she took his little bottle and dipped it into the water and gave it back to Eunice. And as he thanked her, she stroked his face, the meaning of the goddess, and vanished. Eunice went back through that long, dark cave. Out came the dragon again, breathing fire. Hail, holy Suleiman, let me pass. And the dragon withdrew. Eunice went up through the cave. All those boulders scraped his legs, ripped his feet, but he came out into the sunlight, ran down the mountain, through the land of the giant, and just as he was about to reach the river, down came the giant's hand and said, Ah! Now I have done you a favor, now you must do me a favor. You must work for me for a year and a day. And so Eunice worked for the giant for a year and a day. He cleaned the giant's house. Do you know how dirty a giant's house? He cooked for that giant. Do you know how much food a giant eats? And at the end of that year and a day, the giant and Eunice had become friends. A giant with the father. <laughs> the giant waved as Eunice went down towards the river, about to cross the return threshold. And there came the fairy. What? You're alive! And Eunice was so happy, he said, Yes, and I have the three drops from the well of sweetness. Take me across and take me home. Not so fast. Gold? Eunice gave him three gold coins. Hey! He said it only costs three to come this way. Ah, inflation! <laughs> Eunice gave him two more gold coins, and he took him across that broad river. When Eunice stepped upon the shore of his home, he ran all the way to the village. Into his home, he bathed, he dressed himself in the finest silk, and went right to his neighbor's house. Oh, he was so happy. And when the neighbor opened the door, ah, the neighbor was shocked and delighted. You alive? Yes, and Eunice. And look, he held out the bottle. Ah, the neighbor just was in gleeful state, grabbed that bottle and disappeared into the house. Eunice heard a lot of screaming. And then suddenly, just pleasant, happy voices. The neighbor returned with a great smile on his face. Son, the wedding is tomorrow. Oh, it was a fine wedding, a wonderful wedding. Oh, there was food and there were drinks. And Eunice was so happy. And the bride was so lovely and so sweet-tempered. And if the wedding was wonderful, the wedding night was better. <laughs> Eunice woke up radiant. And he lay there smiling and just thinking to himself of his great fortune. And his young bride said sweetly, Eunice, my husband, what are you thinking about? I am just thinking about how happy and lucky I am. Who would have ever thought that you were once ill-tempered? <laughs> what do you mean? Said his brother. Oh, your father sent me all the way to the well of sweetness to bring back those drops to change you. Oh, laughed the bride. They weren't for me. They were for my mother. <laughs> And he smiled an even bigger smile, for he realized that he was truly the most fortunate of men. For there are many men who have a lovely young bride, but there are few men who have a lovely young bride and a sweet-tempered mother in law <laughs> The ultimate boom!
We'll take a short break and then come back for questions. <laughs>